And so I'll officially start the meeting. <clears throat> uh, this is the March 2022 edition of the Mount Vernon Clinic, which is a function of the Fourth Division PNR and MRA. Um, they provide the uh, they provide the uh, Zoom accounts for us to present these, and when we hold the clinics in person, they pay the rent for the room. So, um, in way of announcements, um, I screwed up, had a memory lapse, and forgot that I had a different clinician tentative. I shouldn't say tentatively scheduled for tonight. And then I contacted Ron and anyhow, Ron's clinics got moved up a month. So he's gonna do part two of his scratch building clinic tonight and part three next month. And then Kent Sullivan is gonna do his uh, Cedar Woolley, Northern Pacific and Cedar Woolley in May. Um, and I definitely will not forget this time. <laughs> Ron, Ron has been very gracious and understanding and moving up a month. And Kent has been uh, very understanding too. So um, if I wasn't for good people, I'd be looking like more like a fool than I am. <laughs> um, and we have other announcements on the, um, the Mount Vernon Clinic is putting on a Saturday event. Um, we're, we're holding a, a small swap meet on the 30th of April at the uh, Mount Vernon Senior Center. Um, details are in the grab iron. Um, we have a few, it, it's, it's a small, small swap meet, a dozen, dozen and a half or so tables. Uh, we have, uh, we still have a few tables left. Um, tables are a nominal donation of $10. And we are also offering half tables for $5. Um, if you want to rent a table, um, look up the article in the grab iron and um, the instructions are there. Basically email me and uh, pay for the table at the door. Admission to the swap meet is going to be free. It's open to anybody and everybody. Um, in addition to the, the rooms with the swap tables, um, there's gonna be another room in the senior center that they call the game room that has some tables and chairs that'll be open for people just to gather around and get reacquainted after two years of not being able to see anybody in person. We're hoping things will be opened up enough that um, people will be comfortable to gather around and yak. Um, COVID precautions will be whatever is in effect for Skagit County and or the city of Mount Vernon. Um, our hope is everybody is vaccinated and be prepared to wear a mask if that is the order of the day. So if you have any questions or anything about that, um, look up the article in the grab iron and uh, drop me an email. So did anybody else have any other announcements um, they'd like to make? Okay, uh, Ron, you about ready to go? Let me, uh, let me, make you a co-host that should enable, that should enable you to share screen. Uh, let's see. And as soon as you get your screen up, oh, let me, um, let me mute everybody. And then Ron, you may have to re-unmute yourself. Okay. Nope, you're unmuted, so you're good to go. So I'll mute myself and uh, let you have at it. 
Okay, uh, are you seeing my screen? Are you, are you seeing my screen? Yes, okay. I see it. That's okay. good. Okay. Um, well, thanks. I'm glad to be here again. Um, I just want to remind you to begin with that I uh, model in uh, quarter inch scale and mostly wood and primary structures. Uh, some of the things I will mention today are more uh, difficult in smaller scales, but uh, probably possible for expert modelers like you all. Um, the things I want to cover tonight are uh, why I scratch build, uh, some favorite tools and materials, um, I'll look at a few completed projects, and then I have some thoughts about scenery too that I kind of consider scratch building. <clears throat> well, one of the reasons that I scratch build is uh, to fit a particular scene or purpose. For example, uh, I had this uh, tank car, whoops, sorry. This uh, tank car was uh, based on a on a, a foundation of uh, two uh, log buggies, and uh, I like the way it turned out. Um, <clears throat> my layout didn't have an, a natural demand for uh, a tank car, but I uh, wanted a tank car, and so I developed this uh, concept of a fuel distributor and. Um, that's that's a good reason for scratch building. The uh, freight house in the back is also uh, scratch built, um, freelance. Or you may uh, do some scratch building because you need to fit a specific base. Actually, at least in a quarter inch scale, there aren't very many uh, bridge kits around. And so um, almost many things that you might want to do would require some scratch building here. I had a particular um, rather short radius um, trestle that I needed to build. and um, Or you might want to represent a particular prototype. I wanted a replica of a uh, early uh, 20th century Northern Pacific station uh, from Moclix, Washington. And um, uh, that happens to be the area that I'm modeling on my layout. And um, so this is, this is my uh, somewhat weathered version of that station. Um, <clears throat> uniqueness is another reason. Uh, I have seen some suggestions in the literature about uh, uh, engine shelters that were not enclosed. And uh, I thought that was a kind of neat idea. And so I came up with this um, freelance model. Um, and other practical reasons, perhaps the most important really, uh, are things like the local availability of supplies. With the disappearance of uh, hobby shops, uh, it's harder and harder to find um, craftsman kits and that sort of thing that you can look at without ordering them on the internet. Um, anyway, I, I enjoy the fact that much of the material I need for scratch building can be found at uh, Joanne's or uh, Hobby Lobby, places like that. Uh, then I was also interested in the NMRA Achievement Program and of course scratch building uh, of, uh, in several categories occurs uh, as relevant in that program. But mainly I just find it to be fun and I get more pleasure out of having scratch built. Now I'm gonna talk a while about tools and materials. Uh, this is not in any, by any means a list of the tools that you have to have to do scratch building. It's just some observations about the tools that I use. Uh, the first important thing is to just keep the tools you have. You're going to need them all. And uh, 
first thing you need is a good place to work. And um, I have my primary uh, bench under my layout. And so it's a little bit short on uh, headroom, but otherwise it's a not ideal location because I'm close to the, the place of uh, use and uh, it, it works well for me. Uh, I do work on a glass surface. It's flat and uh, easy to clean. I can scrape it with a razor blade if I get uh, paint and glue on it and so forth. Um, I've been using this glass surface for mm, going on 15 years and I'd kind of like to replace it because it's getting pretty scratched up, but still um, it, it's, a, it's a nice surface. This little roll around cart uh, was just made out of some boxes that I had uh, from a previous uh, life as a magazine, model railroad magazine collector, and I had stored my magazines in uh, versions of these boxes. I put them together in this little cart, which um, uh, rolls around and uh, is slightly lower than my workbench. And actually, it's a really useful really useful surface to have just off my right hand when I'm working on a model. I recently added the uh, tiered steps in it for the storage of uh, paint. Uh, this particular uh, tool was a little bit extravagant, but uh, it's very effective. Craft uh, Optics is the company that makes these uh, prescription magnifying glasses. Uh, if you ever decide to invest in one of these, be sure to get the uh, light. Uh, the light makes all the difference in the world. I want to emphasize uh, the importance of documentation. Uh, the camera is a brutal critic uh, and therefore a very effective tool for improving uh, your modeling. And I don't think it matters really uh, for that purpose, whether you're talking about a $20,000 Leica or your uh, iPhone. Um, it's just a, a really useful tool. I take a lot of pictures. I have about uh, 6,000 uh, images from uh, 15 years of modeling since I got my first digital camera. And um, I wish I had more. Uh, but I also wish they were better organized uh, because they're just chronological and um, a diary helps a little bit. Uh, I keep a written diary of um, what I'm working on. Uh, it's not very detailed and it takes a lot of uh, discipline to maintain a diary, but it's uh, very useful. If I can find the approximate date of uh, a reference I need from one of my photographs, then I can look at the diary and find out how I did uh, something. If you use a phone for your camera, I strongly recommend one of these very inexpensive uh, shutter uh, remotes. It operates on uh, Bluetooth and uh, allows you to hold the camera out at uh, a distance and, and uh, take photos. I'm also an enthusiastic uh, supporter of uh, computer-aided design. I'm not an expert at it. I use only a two-dimensional program and uh, I uh, am sure that uh, I'm missing a lot of the advantages, but uh, I, I, can, I can do what I need to do. I began by trying CAD Rail, a, a program that you've probably seen advertised that's designed specifically for model railroaders, probably has some advantages for model railroaders, but I just couldn't, I just couldn't get it. I played with it and just couldn't understand it. Um, so I tried another uh, program called TurboCAD. I use uh, Mac computers and uh, TurboCAD is a program that's available for Mac. And uh, it just clicked better for me. And uh, so now I use it 
all the time. And these are just a couple of examples, a flat car frame and uh, some of the details for a station that I was building. Uh, SketchUp is a free CAD program on the internet that's uh, frequently recommended and uh, can do three-dimensional stuff. I haven't used it, um, but people I respect think it's great. And um, if you're thinking about getting into 3D printing, which I haven't done, um, then uh, SketchUp or some other uh, three-dimensional CAD program would be very important. Another tool I use is uh, or are mockups. Um, these are just I'm, my mockups are pretty simple cardstock uh, shapes. Sometimes I draw some uh, windows uh, or doors on the uh, subject, but it is in no way detailed. I don't intend them to be permanent models at all. I use them just to assess the fit and proportions of models and how things are going to look and fit together in a scene. Um, you can see here that during some stages of my own layout progress, uh, I've done a lot of uh, mock-ups. Most of the people who visited my layout uh, agree that the mock-ups uh, serve a useful purpose, although I had uh, a one guest a few years ago, a really uh, very good mocker uh, from the Northwest who works fast and changed scale several times, a real expert. And he thinks they're a waste of time because he can build a model as fast as I can build a mock-up. <clears throat> For several years, I've been milling my own strip wood. Um, I really recommend it. I know it won't fit the interests of uh, a lot of people, but um, you can probably save a little money. But the main thing is uh, it reduces inventory and increases convenience if you need uh an extra few feet of two by four or uh 12 by 16 um you know i can produce it uh right away and i don't have to order it uh i don't have to have it on hand um it's it's great plus i'm a reformed woodworker and so i just enjoy working with wood and having justification for some extra tools um in that regard, I strongly recommend uh, these Burns model machines. They're slightly more expensive than uh, Micromark's variations, but um, if you're interested in milling your own strip wood, uh, these are really the way to go. <clears throat> but whether you buy it or make it, you need a place to store things like strip wood and uh, styrene and uh, I made this uh, little throw together uh, box. These shelves slide out and um, the shelves or uh, the dividers between the compartments can be uh, easily moved or rearranged. And um, it's been, been very handy. And I might note that I rarely discard scraps. These. Uh, these are two drawers that are right under my workbench, uh, one where I throw bits of scrap wood and uh, the other where I throw uh, bits of sheet material, leftovers. I mentioned in the last clinic uh, my uh, interest in gator foam. Uh, so I'm just going to review that. Gator foam is a uh, very dense foam core with 64 inch wood fiber veneer on each side. Uh, it's available in white or black. Um, it's, it creates a panel that's uh, strong, lightweight, warp resistant, and you can cut it with a knife or saw. This is an example of a project that I was working on a couple of years ago that um, was a, uh, a gator foam structure. Uh, then covered with scribed wood and uh, other materials. And uh, in measuring, I don't know if I'm an outlier or not, but I'm certainly different from what I read in the magazines. I, I essentially never use a scale rule, except as a straight edge. It's just too imprecise. I'd make all of my measurements with uh, either a calipers 
or a uh, good quality uh, standard ruler. And then if necessary, I use a calculator to get the uh, transitions I need. Actually working in quarter inch scale is a great advantage because it turns out that one inch is almost exactly 20 thousandths. So if I need a two by four, 40 thousandths by 80 thousandths is pretty close. And I can do that kind of arithmetic in my head. <clears throat> One of the main things I want to emphasize about successful modeling is uh, when you cut things, get as close as you need to be, but then you sand it to fit. You don't expect it to fit perfectly when it's cut. Um, so I've chopped a lot of things with the uh, Northwest Shortline Chopper. I'm sure most of you have used that. Just in the last few weeks, uh, this new tool uh, the, called the Slicer has been uh, released by uh, a company called Olimation that has some uh, ambiguous connection with Mont Albert scale lumber and uh, uh, fast track hand laid uh, fast tracks. Um, and the sander I've used for years is this nine inch uh, disc sander variable speed that I got from Micromark. Uh, a six inch sander like this one is uh, very common among modelers. And among my railroaders recently, this um, six inch sander, but manually operated also by Ultimation, the same company as the Slicer has become uh, quite popular. I resisted it for a long time. I thought uh, since I was so happy with a nine inch uh, <clears throat> electric sander, uh, why would I want to switch over? But actually I got one of these a year or so ago and it's a, it's a marvelous tool. But anyway, the point is cut it close and then sand it to fit. Uh, for drilling, uh, I recommend that uh, you should have these uh, drill gauges. I have three of them. Uh, this is the one that would probably be most useful. Uh, it's the uh, number 60 to number, number 61 to number 80 uh, drill sizes for uh, models. Uh, but I have also found the number uh, 40 to number uh, 41 to 60. Uh, drill sizes to be very useful. And this is the numbered uh, size drill gauge. And this, this is the fractional size drill gauge. These are some uh, micro reamers. I got these from Micromark uh, for, for making small holes just a little bit bigger. These reamers are really great. And I've used them quite a bit more than I would have expected. You're all familiar with some version of the uh, number uh, 61 to 80 uh, drill bits. And uh, I have this version and a couple of others. Um, but I also uh, secured a uh, number 41 through 60 uh, set of numbered drill bits. And uh, so it's the next size larger than the ones in these plastic cases. And it's, uh, it's a very useful set, not something you use every day, but something that I think can really improve your modeling. Um, excuse me. I have not used a Dremel tool much over the years. I had uh, a Dremel tool 60 years ago. So uh, not that I was an early adopter, but I've been, I've had one for a long time, but uh, a lot of the, uh, potential uses that uh, are advertised for Dremel tools are not things that I needed a Dremel tool for. But part of that uh, resistance was because my Dremel tool being old had a power cord. Uh, a couple of years ago, I got this uh, lithium ion battery uh, Dremel motor tool. And uh, I find that I reached for it more often now because it's so easy to use. It's got a chuck instead of collets and uh, variable speed. 
long battery life, so it's always ready when I pick it up. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice tool. <clears throat> I included this to emphasize uh, the benefit of having multiple um, pin vices. I, I always hated changing the collets and pin vices. It seemed, uh, I don't know, just not so much that it's a waste of time, but just <laughs> I just didn't really enjoy it. Uh, so I finally uh, purchased a very inexpensive set of uh, four pin vices. Each has a different size chuck. And um, it's made my life a whole lot better. And then if you use some kind of an electric drill or uh, a drill press, you may find it difficult to chuck small bits. Uh, these auxiliary uh, chucks are very useful. <laughs> a year or so ago, I uh, saw uh, a YouTube video from by uh, Jack Burgess about some of the tools he uses. Jack is a, uh, a wonderful modeler in the Bay Area, and uh, he has a series of uh, videos about his modeling. Uh, one was some uh, video about uh, his uh, powered models and his, and his hand tools. And uh, he mentioned this uh, Cameron drill press. And I had had a uh, hobby drill press from Micromark that I uh, liked, but uh, it, it, it did not have some of the features that I wished I had. So I sprung for this uh, Cameron, uh, which is probably much more than needed. It's really designed for uh, tool maker, uh, jewelry makers and uh, uh, watch makers, uh, but it's a, it's a very nice tool and uh, uh, variable speed, uh, wonderful uh, Japanese chuck, great tool. I recommend it if you can afford it. Um, oh, uh, one other thing, it also, while very, a lot of variable speed tools don't slow down to a slow enough speed, well, this one slows down to a very slow speed, but it also runs at a very high speed. So I can, by using router bits in this tool, I can use it as a uh, router or a milling machine as well. I use a lot of jigs and fixtures. Um, these are uh, just a, a, a variety. I think I mentioned in my last clinic, uh, one of my most useful jigs is just this uh, sheet of uh, six inch square, 40,000 styrene with a lip around, a square cornered lip around two edges uh, for assembling very square uh, corners. Other ways that I use to keep things square are uh, these, uh, Angle blocks uh, and a one, two, three block. Uh, these have been mentioned in previous clinics as well. Uh, this thin beam square is very useful because it uh, is only slightly thicker in the beam than uh, 40,000 styrene, so, or 16th inch uh, sheet basswood, so you can uh, make uh, well supported cuts. These are some of the vices and clamps I use. Uh, not too much new here, but I'll just give you my comments. Uh, of course, uh, I have a pan of vice. Uh, this Microlux uh, vice is designed for use with uh, drill presses. And it's, it, it really is a very nice little vice and uh, probably the one I use most. This uh, tool, I can't think of the name of it, but it's, uh, I'm sure you've seen it at uh, train shows, it is a very, very nice way to hold shapes of, uh, uh, objects of odd shape. And um, it also serves as a normal vice, handheld vice with uh, uh, just square jaws. Um, the handle, is this uh, wood handle that you'd hold in your hand is the way it's usually uh, sold. I added a, a flat, a large flat uh, knob so that I could use it as a benchtop vice as well. 
Uh, it's about uh, an inch and a half or two inches in diameter to give you an idea of scale if you haven't seen it before. The one disadvantage of it is that it closes on a counterclockwise turn of the uh, knob and opens on a clockwise turn. And I can never seem to get that right. So every time I try to change the, the uh, jaw opening, I uh, do it wrong the first try. These are just to show that I use all the regular clamps. And um, here for clamping longer uh, spaces, I have a bar clamp. And uh, these uh, clamps, I think, from a German manufacturer, neither of which I have found particularly useful. I don't think I've used the bar clamps more than two or three times. And these clamps uh, from Europe, uh, they tension by uh, the way they're stressed on this uh, microfiber rod. Uh, but the, the problem is that uh, the, the jaws, excuse me, the jaws have to be in the same plane. And so if they get twisted a little bit vis-a-vis -vis each other, then they spring apart. So the ones I found most useful are just these super cheap plastic things. And I don't use forceps very often, but once in a while you need to clamp very securely some real small or thin uh, object, and uh, then the forceps are usable. And uh, <clears throat> for tweeters and third hands, uh, here I've used these old uh, Dixon sweeters, twe tweezers uh, for 50 years, and they're starting to wear out. Wear out in the sense I can't see the wear but I can't seem with a file or sandpaper to get the jaws uh, so clean that they hold things the way they used to hold them. So I've been looking for replacements and uh, these uh, pure vigor uh, tweezers that I found um, are really, really nice. The point is so sharp, you could actually hurt yourself. Um, and they, the points of course match perfectly. It's a little expensive, but I think it's going to be a good investment. And then uh, just a few months ago, I found on Amazon a set of about 12, 10 or 12 file, uh, tweezers of different shapes uh, for only uh, 12 or $15. And they were um, so inexpensive, I was suspicious that they might not be satisfactory, but I decided to try them. And so far, I'm really impressed. The jaws all made up the way you'd expect, even for expensive tweezers and so forth. And I'm, I mentioned these just because these are some of the big tweezers you've probably seen in the hobby shops, if you've been, if you can find a hobby shop. Um, they're two inches longer than the ordinary tweezers, and they're not precise, they're not very useful for building things, but for placing things in hard to reach spaces like an interior detail or uh, a piece of scenery that you're adding at arm's length, they're really great for that. And with regard to third hands, I never had any luck at all with these kinds of third hands that I'd found at um, swap meets and uh, train shows. Uh, but uh, a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago, Ted Becker recommended these uh, Kato things um, on, in a clinic. And I uh, ordered some of those and I'm really impressed so far. And then I had uh, just before that uh, found, I think from Jack Burgess's recommendation again, um, this, uh, third hand, which uh, comes from a company called uh, GRS. And they do uh, jewelry vices, jewelry makers vices, and a few other jewelry maker tools. Anyway, this is a really uh, precision kind of uh, tool if you need it. Uh, a little pricey, but it weighs two or three pounds, so it doesn't move around. It's uh, fairly tall, so you can reach over things and so forth. I use all these adhesives, um, but uh, not too often. I'll show in the next slide. Uh, these glue loopers are an interesting thing. If you haven't, if you're not aware of them, you might want to do a little uh, looking into them. Uh, they are a, a blade with just a loop on the end that fits into a 
exacto knife and uh, a very useful way to administer ACC cement. Uh, but my go-to, uh, as I think I mentioned in the previous clinic, is uh, Aileen's tacky glue. And uh, I use a syringe for almost all applications. It's uh, sticky, flexible, dries promptly, and you can take it apart if you have to. And for window glazing, I like this uh, liquid PSA. Somebody at last clinic, I think it was Ted, mentioned uh, canopy glue. And uh, it may be an equally good alternative. I, I don't know anything about canopy glue, but the uh, PSA does not squeeze out. So you get a real clear glazing. Um, I try to finish wood before assembly where possible. Uh, and I always start with uh, grain or texture and my two most used tools for grain and texture are a screwdriver blade for deep grain uh, exposure. And this homemade tool, a bunch of uh, exacto blades, number 11, in a wooden handle uh, for uh, smaller grain. Um, and the others I've uh, all used, and you can imagine how they might work. Uh, this tool here I made uh, intending it to be used for uh, nail holes, and uh, it really doesn't work very well. And I, uh, after adding some grain, I always dirty the wood. You want to add the grain first so that the uh, wash for the grain, uh, wash for the uh, dirtying will uh, sink into the grain. But uh, during most of my modeling career, I have used uh, leather dye uh, mixed with uh, isopropyl alcohol, three to eight drops per ounce. Uh, so that's a fairly weak solution. Recently, though, in the last couple of years, I decided to finally try uh, these hundred line stains, and I really like them, although they are way too dark for my main purpose. Uh, so I thin them uh, one third stain and two thirds alcohol. And uh, the cordovan brown is, uh, I think, a really nice color. It, it's um, kind of a brownish, but gray weathering color. And uh, creosote black, to my eye, looks a little blue. Uh, my wife, who's an artist, uh, doesn't see it as blue. For adding color, I mostly nowadays use pan pastels. Uh, probably everybody is familiar with pan pastels, but if you're not, they're these uh, cakey things that are usually applied with a sponge, sponges in a lot of different formats. Uh, one thing I would call to your attention is that you can get a pallet tray that accommodates these uh, and has it accommodates these uh, individual pastel containers and has a cover. And so uh, these are all the colors that I use, and I can just cover it and slide it into an innocuous spot, and uh, it's a really useful. Thing. I don't have to take the lids off individually. No, no lids here, just the tray color. Uh, many modelers use these pastels primarily for weathering. I like them even for the main coloration on my wooden uh, models uh, because it gives kind of a weathered, worn appearance, a variation from board to board and so forth. And uh, some people use an overspray. I do not. I have Pan pastels. If you'd like to get started with them, uh, it's a very, uh, very useful DVD. For paints, I uh, used to be hung up on uh, model paints, focal and uh, polyscale primarily. Uh, but uh, partly being stimulated by an article uh, in the uh, Railroad Model Craftsman a few years ago, I decided to try uh, craft paints and they're cheap. Uh, 
and they're fine, at least for structures. I don't know that I would want to spray paint a new brass loco with craft paints, but uh, I, I think they're uh, a really good alternative. And they come a lot of colors. I've been thinning with airbrush medium. Another hint I picked up a while back, I think maybe from the Model Railroad Hobbyist, but I can't remember for sure. That's the online uh, magazine. I always hated stirring paints, opening paint, and then stirring for just a few brushfuls. And uh, so now I've got all my paint stored in uh, 20 milliliter dropper bottles. And I put in a stainless steel mixing ball all these things are available very inexpensively on uh, the Amazon. On Amazon, uh, then I thin 50/50 with airbrush medium and add uh, just a very small amount of uh, uh, flow aid uh, to improve the flow a little bit. Uh, then I discovered this palette paper, which is kind of like wax paper. It's not transparent, but it's sort of uh, slick surface on one side and matte surface on the other. And I tear off a sheet, cut it up in little pieces and uh, dispense small amounts on uh, palette paper, use that for mixing and for application. And so when I need just a dab of paint, now it's a 25 second exercise instead of take off the lid, stir it up, spread it on, clean the brush, wipe the cap, I don't know, it just seems so much easier. When I'm using paint, I usually want some sort of worn appearance. I hardly ever want anything to be just painted. So mostly I use a brush, often dry or a rag. Uh, usually I add additional weathering with pan pastels. I don't often use an airbrush. Uh, I know airbrush can be useful for weathering and so forth. I probably don't appreciate its capabilities because I haven't used it a lot. I keep thinking I will do more, but I haven't really done more. Anyway, I do have a spray booth. Uh, when we, might, when we uh, redid our house, uh, this was a leftover kitchen cabinet, uh, blocked off a quadrant of it and uh, put in this um, furnace filter and a uh, Dayton uh, blower, you just need to be sure you get a spark proof uh, blower, spark free blower, and uh, it sits in the garage right next to an external door. And so uh, I just vent it to the outside in these infrequent times when I use it by this, uh, I have a, I don't know, a 15 foot piece of this uh, tube that people use in woodworking shops for uh, dust collection and it fits on the bottom of the blower and I stick the other end out the door and uh, it works pretty well. <clears throat> now you may be interested in how I do castings. Uh, if there's to be a wood appearance, then I prime them with uh, a tan colored uh, can, uh, uh, what do you call it, a uh, sh shaker can, and uh, then finish them with paint or chalk and alcohol or pan pastel. And if there's to be a metal appearance, or if they are metal castings, then I would blacken them. Or if not metal, then I uh, prime them with uh, either dark gray or light gray primer, depending on what I'm looking for, and then finish them with paint or chalk or pan pastel. For individual castings, I usually establish a base color of rust, and uh, the color I often use is dark rust, which is a very, uh, very useful kind of warm brown color. One third roof brown and two thirds rust in the old uh, focal uh, kind of colors. And then I weather with uh, chalk or an alcohol slurry, and you can see uh, some of the effects that are obtained. And for castings with multiple elements, like these uh, resin shelves or uh, this junk pile or this pile of stuff, I prime with whatever I think the dominant hue is. And then I add colors with paint 
And then I toned down everything with repeated black washes. And so uh, you can actually use fairly bright colors like this, these shelves. I've got some reds and greens and blues and yellows. Uh, but you tone them down enough and they look like uh, the real thing. I read, uh, probably you all did too, in Real World Model Craftsman, I think it was, a few a couple of years ago, of these uh, weathering pencils that um, aircraft models use. And uh, so I had to have some, of course, and I couldn't be satisfied with just two or three colors. So I bought the whole set. And I'm still, the jury's still out. I haven't found a lot of need for them yet. There are some things uh, you can do with them. I don't recommend against them, but um, I don't think they need to be your first priority. Um, but they, they deal with details. You know, the aircraft models and military models do a lot of really detailed uh, weathering and um, these are good for that kind of stuff. We're supposed to be able to use them both wet and dry. And then this is just a closing uh, comment about some handy helpers that I use for dirty jobs. Uh, I, I drink a lot of Diet Coke and uh, from Costco I buy Diet Coke in these uh, cardboard trays and um, they are really useful for uh, some things like uh, that preliminary stain of strip wood, strip wood and stuff. I can do it on my lap. And, uh, then I have a, some edges around the outside to uh, place things on while it's drying and so forth. And then I have uh, a whole bunch of uh, like eight by 11, uh, pieces of masonite that were used uh, in the way I was storing magazines for a while. And uh, they make great pallets. So I just uh, use them anytime I have to do uh, something like I want to lay down a piece of strip wood and dirty it with chalk and stuff. I can do it on this without getting my workbench so dirty. These are all variations on double face tape, really useful. And uh, these are called uh, black acrylic gloves. They're the same weight as uh, regular latex gloves, uh, but they can be used over and over again. They don't tear the second time you put them on and you don't have to use powder and so forth. I really recommend them. You can get them cheaply at Home Depot or almost anywhere. Uh, <clears throat> okay, let's talk about some projects. Uh, most of my experience has been with structures, but I do have some experience with uh, rolling stock and um, motive power. And these are two examples. Um, I'm going to talk just about structures today. My first two scratch projects uh, happen to be this close together on my layout. This is a um, cabin that was made with styrene and uh, uses uh, commercial uh, window and door castings. This was uh, my first uh, board by board construction. And uh, it, uh, it was pretty satisfying. It was a little gas station I'd always admired. Uh, people like it, got best of show at a, a, a NMR meet. Uh, in uh, Boise a few years ago. So popular people like it. I mean, real people like it too, I guess. Um, the one flaw I think is that I, the uh, gas sign was made with uh, computer decals and uh, I didn't figure out how to get the uh, backing of the decal quite invisible. My first big project was an engine house uh, I used the resin walls from a Magnuson Models Highland Stations kit that you've been in the modeling a long time would have seen, I'm sure, in the magazines. Uh, I picked one up at a uh, 
uh, train show or swap meet. Uh, no idea what I was ever going to do with it. But uh, uh, when I eventually decided to build an engine house, uh, I decided to, I thought it could be useful. So I cut off the tops of the uh, peaked ends, uh, pieced them together with um, sides and uh, got a long enough uh, segment to uh, be an engine house. And uh, then I boarded up uh, some doors and windows and the inside walls were covered with uh, dirty tripwood planks. Uh, <clears throat> uh, some useful ideas about how to frame the inside were uh, provided to me by Tom Beaton. He had a model with a, a, a canted roof like this. And uh, Tom's a, a, a fantastic modeler in Victoria, BC. Uh, and then I used styrene jakes to uh, to make those uh, timber framing for the uh, main structure and for the rafters. And the roof is removable so that uh, I had access to the interior uh, for future machine shop. And this was done 15 years ago. So the interior lights are from Michael Bobes and brass lampshades. If I were doing it now, of course, I'd use some kind of LED combination. The uh, <clears throat> roof ventilator was kind of tricky and uh, required uh, more styrene and wood jigs to get these uh, louvers in place. The shingles are Simpson uh, paper with um, Roof brown and rust slathered on. I mean, literally slathered. Uh, very, very messily application, messily applied. This addition on the rear provides lots of open doors for visibility of the future machine shop and uh, extended the length a little bit. So, just in the last year or so, I added the interior details. Uh, some uh, from uh, kits and uh, some from scratch build. Some from the junk box. And uh, a model of a specific prototype was the uh, Moclip station. Uh, my layout set in 1940 and focused on Moclips, which is a village on the coast of the Olympic Peninsula. Uh, there was a Northern Pacific station opened there in 1906, had the original plans for the museum for that uh, station, and I built it first as it looked at its opening in 1906 for the museum. My, mom, my layout is set in uh, 1940, 35 years later. And uh, so I built another model that looks well-maintained, but shows uh, some wear. I actually gave a clinic at uh, Tacoma on this uh, topic uh, last month, or recently anyway. And uh, it's on YouTube if you're interested in this particular project. The top slide here shows the uh, museum model and the bottom, the uh, more weathered model that I have on my layout. Uh, another uh, prototype inspired uh, models were the uh, canneries and shingle mill. These were the two primary industry industries in uh, Moclips uh, in the era that I'm modeling, uh, fish canneries and uh, cedar shingle mills. With regard to canneries, uh, this old photo shows the way they were uh, um, pretty close together along the uh, Moclips River. Um, this is a uh, recent photo, and I believe this company is now out of business. Um, this is uh, the way they appear on my model. I had originally planned uh, three canneries here because they look so jammed together in the photos. But I decided that it was too much of a view block. Uh, my, uh, my layout is pretty high. Uh, so this is almost eye level here. And I didn't want to completely block the view of the station. So I modeled the uh, middle cannery as uh, recently destroyed or uh, taken out. Then uh, I needed a shingle mill because that's really the focus of my layout. And uh, the major shingle mail in the area is shown in these two photographs. Um, 
a scale replica wasn't really possible because it's just a very large operation. And um, I didn't have enough information really to do it in great detail, but I could uh, extract the essential elements from these two photos. Um, the first is that there are several linked buildings. Uh, it's not a, not a simple one building deal. There's a slash burner in the background. There were drying kilns exemplified by these uh, chimneys. There was a packing and shipping area and uh, steam power and a log dump on the Moclips River. Um, so I could incorporate those elements, I thought. I didn't have any construction photos. Uh, I didn't have, I wasn't following my own advice, taking a lot of photos and keeping a diary. Um, but I did use cardstock mock-ups mock and uh, printed full-size plans, cut and assembled gator foam, gator foam cores for most of these uh, segments and applied triplet siding. Um, the shingle mill needed real shingles, so I cut a lot of shingles from a plank, a cedar plank. Um, I first cut the plank into 20,000 inch strips. Those would be one inch in O scale. Then I ripped that, those strips into scale widths. And then I stained those with shoe dye and alcohol and uh, chopped into 18 inch long shingles. So um, I actually the chopping uh, took as long as applying the things. Uh, but anyway, I, I made about 10,000 shingles. And uh, so then uh, to apply them, I drew horizontal lines on the plywood at one eighth inch intervals. And so uh, a uh, 18 inch shingle in O scale is 3 16 inch long. That means a 1 16 inch or six inch reveal. I backed up the bottom row with uh, horizontal layers of uh, shingles. And uh, then I glued random width shingles uh, from side to side, butting them to the guidelines and uh, covering the cracks between shingles from subsequent rows. And uh, this is the outcome. Uh, Pretty satisfactory, uh, probably a little more ragged than actual shingles would be uh, because the chopper doesn't chop everything to exactly the same length. It chops things to an approximate length. And, uh, uh, but I, I'm satisfied with the effect. Uh, and then I used a MDF foundation, uh, strip wood, board and batten siding over data from core. I had applied a flow stain oak uh, color before assembly and uh, took about 8,500 shingles to do that roof. Then I added the uh, log intake building. This was one where I tried a sound module and uh, I had listened to one at a convention and thought it was pretty impressive, but uh, the one I obtained anyway uh, was uh, so same from the beginning to the end that it just, was tedious. It was almost like having white noise. So I, that was an unsuccessful experiment. Uh, this is the, the annex uh, and the uh, conveyor are scratch built. The, it happens that I used a kit for the uh, slash burner uh, from Sidetrack and uh, put a kitchen top strainer on the top. And I painted with that rust uh, rail brown mix that I've mentioned earlier. I combined the two buildings that were separate in the uh, prototype uh, for shipping and receiving and uh, uh, drying kilns. Um, the, uh, the drying kilns were backed by uh, brick paper. Obviously, you wouldn't have wood on the back of a kiln. Uh, but the brick paper doesn't really show from any perspective. So uh, it's probably a waste of effort. Um, the awning is uh, HO scale rib roof seaming, uh, roofs, ribbed seam roofing. And uh, 
the roof here is a tar paper made of tissue paper painted on with grimy black. I mentioned that in my last clinic. Uh, the chimneys are stacked styrene. Uh, and uh, in the next clinic, I hope to talk about uh, how to make some chimneys. The shingle bundles were just leftover shingles that were uh, banded with strips of construction paper. This is the power plant. Uh, the boiler and the uh, engine are both Western scale models kits. Here, uh, the log dump is uh, wood dowels uh, really beaten up with uh, steel wire brushes. And uh, stiff legged Derek was from uh, Crow River Products with lift and slew engines, both also Crow River Products. Here's the log dump and uh, ramp. And this photo shows some very interesting digital distortion that I've never seen anywhere else. And I have no idea how it can happen, but this was done with a digital camera, but it looks like somebody uh, twisted a negative in, uh, in uh, reproducing the, this photo. I, I, I just don't know how that happened. And these are some finished views of the uh, shingle mill. <coughs> A couple of locomotive servicing facilities I want to talk about. Uh, first was Gallo's Turntable, which was actually a fairly difficult project uh, based on a Russell Watson article from 130 Annual. Um, and I think he based his on a, a uh, California, I don't remember which Gallo's Turntable in California, but um, I shortened the bridge because uh, my longest local was going to be about 40 feet and I wanted the space. Um, the table rotates on a circular spider uh, between rails on the base and on the table. And that was the problem in construction. Uh, um, I, this is the base with a ring rail around it. And uh, then uh, these are the uh, containers of the spider, uh, I made uh, a ring drill guide for these styrene rings and uh, made the wheels from uh, inner lead uh, segments of styrene tubing. And uh, here I'm part way into the assembly. And here uh, this, the inner ring and uh, all the spokes are pretty much assembled. Then I jump to uh, a photo that shows the total spider. But notice in uh, photo one and photo three here that I had I had great difficulty getting the outer uh, styrene ring to fit. And I finally capitulated and solved that problem by uh, making the outer ring uh, a collection of individual segments but they still had to fit on the uh, rail around the, uh, at the, at the bottom. And then a corresponding rail on the backside of the deck. And you can see I uh, used a uh, phone plug for the uh, electrical connection. Uh, here's another view of the spider. You can see uh, the upper rail and lower rail and the uh, wheels on the spider, the carrier on the spider. And this is the final bridge, uh, brass uh, wire for the truss rods with grant line turnbuckles, boxcar red applied with a dry brush and uh, lots and lots of nut bolt washer castings. This is the turning path under construction. I also drew a full size uh, plan for that. And uh, here it is in place on my layout. Um, then uh, another project I want to describe briefly was a coaling station. Uh, I'd long been admiring two things that I wanted to model. One was this uh, uh, classic uh, Paul Larson coaling station from uh, June Model Railroad or 1955. I was in high school in 1955 and that was uh, 
you know, a, a very uh, seminal article for me. Um, and then uh, the other one I was interested in was this uh, relatively small tower uh, coaling station from uh, Wayne Woslowski in uh, 1988 RMC. In my early uh, layout planning, I uh, was really leaning toward the tower. And of course, I never, never intended to uh, include the integral sanding facility. But uh, during most of the construction, I ended up uh, relying in my thinking on a uh, mock-up of the uh, bucket station. But something about its shape always uh, troubled me. It, it just seemed like it was too bulky for uh, the task of just getting a little coal into the tender of the locomotive. And uh, so I expect that I might've been influenced as well by the fact that I built a, a couple of these uh, early fine scale miniature HO kits. And of course they were a lot smaller than the O scale I'm now working in. Anyway, for a variety of reasons, I settled on the tower. It's based on a, a uh, 20 to 25 ton prototype at Marquette, Michigan. 20 to 25 ton, I think, <coughs> is, is relatively small among coaling towers. And I omitted, I made some changes. I omitted the uh, integral sand house, deleted the uh, coal receiving pit, modified the hoisting and sheet mechanisms, uh, in fact, the photos and uh, plans I had didn't give me enough detail to even duplicate the uh, sheet mechanism, so I had to kind of make that up. And I shortened the lower base by four feet because I'm modeling in narrow gauge and the uh, prototype was standard gauge. It was a complex project, uh, many different sizes of lumber. In fact, this is the uh, the ultimate example of why one would want to mill your own driftwood. Um, I bet there are 25 or 30 different sizes of strip wood in this project. And uh, so even if you had just one $4 package of each of them, and that wouldn't be nearly enough for some, you'd have $125 worth of uh, strip wood. Anyway, uh, the uh, construction required making the skeleton first and then filling the signing the interior siding after the fact. Uh, one thing you want to do if you ever build something like this is make sure you drill for the strip wad, <laughs> drill for the truss rods before assembly, otherwise you'll never get them aligned. Um, so, uh, after I dirtied the wood, I also then uh, colored it some more with uh, pan pastel raw umber, extra dark, which is a very dark uh, brown black color. Uh, then uh, for the roof, I used masking tape and uh, added the upper uh, maintenance platform, <clears throat> the ladders and, uh, and styrene lift mechanism and bucket were all installed. Um, the lift engine was going to be in the neighboring sand shed. And that's why there's a mechanism. This is a pulley mechanism here. You can see the cable coming down and hanging loose. It, it will go into the neighboring sand shed. Um, and then my I thought was that the coal would simply be loaded into the bucket from a pile on the ground rather than uh, dumped into a, uh, a receiving bin. Uh, <clears throat> then I had to add uh, the maintenance platform on the front, uh, the coal gate mechanism, which I modeled after the Chama uh, mechanism because I could find photos of that. Um, the chute and counterweights, uh, the cables here are brass wire, which is easier to make look uh, straight than using string or something like that. Um, I weathered the roof and finished the details. Uh, then when I was installing it, I decided I needed a coal transfer platform. So between the uh, 
track here where the uh, coal gondola would come in and uh, this thing, instead of just having the coal dumped on the ground, I decided on a concrete platform, cut a piece of uh, half inch MDF, segmented it with a saw, added some uh, cracks with a Dremel motor tool and sprayed it flat gray and then dirtied with hunter line stain and pan pastels. Then I added uh, wood backing in one corner and uh, a uh, step, steps and uh, some coal. And uh, this is the final installation. There are two other uh, fairly recent projects uh, for engine servicing. Uh, this water tower was based on a prototype in Chimanius BC uh, using a couple different articles, one in RMC and one in uh, Gazette. And this is a uh, rather unique sanding tower. Uh, it was a Canadian Pacific prototype. Uh, and it happens that I found a, a uh, image on the internet that uh, shows a prototype in uh, Victoria, BC. Um, this was based on a Jack Work article, by the way. He wrote a lot of things in the um, on railroad over the 50s, 60s, and 70s um, and uh, did some beautiful work. Now, I had a few ideas I was going to talk about scenery. Uh, I know people probably don't think of it as scratch building, but I would argue that uh, creating a scene or part of a scene is uh, just like scratch building. You're using parts and putting them together to get get the appearance you want. And so I thought I'd just review uh, some of the things and the way I do scenery. Uh, first of all, about backdrops. Uh, in consultation with my artist uh, spouse, I decided to have no backdrop. Um, we uh, had seen in Boise a couple of layouts that uh, had no backdrop, and I thought they looked pretty good. And uh, while I admire well done painted or photo backdrops, I don't envy them. I don't. I. I. I, I don't really think I needed a backdrop. I um, used a very light blue on the walls, and to me, it makes the uh, smallish train room. My train room's 11 by 14, it makes it uh, seem a little bigger than it might otherwise. Anyway, I'm totally satisfied with no backdrops. Uh, for ballast, I made my own ballast. I used 50% uh, sifted sand, 25% sanded grout, and 25% uh, uh, woodland scenics medium cinders. And uh, I'm Pretty happy with the effect. I've had a few visitors ask about it. Uh, this overall ground cover, um, which I put everywhere, really, uh, as a first layer, is uh, the soil on the streets are sanded grout. Uh, the color I used was light smoke, but you probably would pick a different color. I kind of wish I had picked a little darker color. And the vegetation. Uh, is mostly uh, woodland scenic ground foam. Several, I, I think I have all their colors and all their textures. Um, anyway, quite a variety. The adhesive uh, I use for the ground cover and ballast uh, is uh, I, I first, I, I put it on, get it as level as I can, spray it to wet it, and then drip. Uh, 50-50 white glue out of an eyedropper over the whole area. And the vegetation, uh, for the vegetation and putting down these patches, I brush on white glue full strength and then sprinkle on the foam and uh, fairly quickly after that vacuum so that all the loose stuff is picked up. Uh, and uh, in fact, I just did a piece recently when I waited too long before I vacuumed and more of the loose stuff stuck than I really intended to do. Uh, just a couple of tricks, uh, or a couple of ideas. Uh, toy palm trees make 
pretty good ferns. And the area I'm modeling has a lot of ferns. And uh, so if you paint the plastic uh, toy palm trees, you can make ferns. And uh, for higher bushes and weeds, I used, again, uh, coarse ground foam. Uh, so far, grass tufts, uh, these are from um, Scenic Express. I use a little bit of lichen, there's none shown in this picture, and I haven't used very much lichen, but some lichen. And then uh, Martin Welberg weeds. Martin Welberg is a new product in my experience, but uh, Scenic Express now has it. I didn't uh, when I bought these, uh, but they're, they're much taller weeds and uh, really, really nice, I think. Um, and then I use some sand and some sifted gravel and other uh, rotten wood and so forth. With uh, some exceptions, my uh, coniferous trees are all uh, balsa uh, trunks with uh, caspia branches and uh, ground foam. All uh, Paul Scholes, the local modeler who was so famous for his uh, scenery. And uh, my deciduous trees are mostly Scenic Express super trees with ground foam. I've experimented with some local weeds for uh, deciduous trees, and uh, mostly I would say unsuccessful. I'm not, not too sanguine about them. The logs and stumps are uh, rhododendron. Uh, stumps are cut at branch points so that you get a little bit of uh, spread for the roots. And uh, it's nice to add some of these uh, jumper boards uh, that people stood on when they were cutting the stumps and so forth. There were a lot of wetlands in the area I model, and uh, I can model those by just uh, cutting a depression in my bench work. And uh, then uh, I like low lying trestles, so I run the track through on a trestle, and then I add a bunch of junk like we'd collect in a, in a wet area. And uh, the water is uh, magic water. For mountains and bluffs, I use uh, plaster cloth uh, over uh, stacked foam insulation. I don't have a lot of mountains, and so this might not be cost effective for a very large area, but worked well for a small area. I didn't like uh, commercial rock moldings. They were too stiff, and uh, I just didn't find them satisfactory. So I made my own uh, on the rocks in my backyard just layering on uh, latex and cheesecloth, liquid latex and cheesecloth. The liquid latex was a Woodland Scenics product. And uh, the castings were all fairly small, but you can see from the six inch ruler here. I used dental plaster to make the castings and applied to the mountainside while they were still wet, uh, but firm. And uh, seems, were never a problem. I didn't see any problem with seams, and I just sprayed with acrylic washes. This is a scene on my layout that I thought might have uh, some ideas that you, or it has some ideas. I thought they might be useful to you. Um, I wanted to model the bluffs along uh, the Olympic coast, and uh, I wanted these two routes, even though they basically have to go the same direction because they're going around the wall here. I wanted it to seem that they headed in different directions. So I pointed them slightly differently and then uh, came up with this idea. I uh, put this divider in between them and uh, put the bluffs around them. They put the divider with uh, these bowling ball holes in case I ever had to lift it out. It's not big enough that I could have a pop out, a pop up. Um, but I thought I might sooner or later have to do some maintenance. And uh, fortunately, this has now been probably 10 years. I haven't had to do any maintenance, but um, anyway, I could. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a uh, prototype photo from where the uh, old Northern Pacific had come down the coastal bluff and is turning inland. This is a contemporary photo of that same spot. 
And so you can, you can kind of get a sense of uh, how rugged the uh, bluffs along the ocean were. And this is my model of that uh, area. Um, and I'm satisfied that this route, I can make myself believe that this route goes a different direction than this route. And there were a few other things on this uh, niche that I wanted to show you. This is an example of uh, extreme kit bashing. I built a uh, Campbell scale model of the Chama coaling station, HO scale, in, uh, oh, I don't know, the 60s or 70s, a long time ago. And I uh, had it on a little diorama under uh, my record storage area, and I dropped a pile of records on it. And uh, that's not a good way to treat a diorama. It smashed it pretty badly. Uh, I didn't think it was really, <coughs> excuse me, really repairable, but my, uh, my wife, uh, Judy, wouldn't let me throw it away. And so I've had it all these years. And I finally uh, found a place for it. Here, it uh, being HO scale provides a little distance perspective. It's in the back corner and uh, it's dilapidated. Uh, so it serves as a uh, abandoned mine. Um, And uh, here's an example of getting two vehicles from one. Uh, this was a plastic model of a German uh, uh, staff car. And uh, I took the chassis and the front end and uh, made a uh, flatbed, flatbed truck. And uh, the back end is uh, an abandoned vehicle in the brush there. Uh, here I used real moss in quite a few places on my layout uh, because there's so much moss around in uh, the area where uh, we have a condo over in Moclips. And I just thought it would be an interesting experiment. I wouldn't, I'm not really recommending it, uh, but it did work. And if you do use it, uh, you should paint it before you put it down uh, because it eventually dries out and uh, then you get uh, these, dry places. Uh, this burned out stump was a following a suggestion by uh, Tom Beaton. Uh, again, he's that uh, excellent modeler in British Columbia, Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, just drill a hole on the top of a stump and hit it with a blowtorch. And uh, these are uh, some mushrooms on a rotten log, which are just uh, discs of uh, thin styrene punched with a paper punch and stuck into the side of a log. And that's it, I guess. Sorry, I think it went a little long, but uh, it was fun, thanks. Well, thank you very much, Ron. Any questions or comments for Ron? Very nice job. I'm glad to hear that you uh, took my suggestion and tried that uh, Cotto uh, flex arm thing. I really like mine. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm very impressed with it uh, so far. <clears throat> if uh, if any of you have follow up ideas that you want to discuss or anything, feel free to contact me by email. So any other, no more comments, questions? Again, uh, thank you very much, Ron. That was excellent. I uh, picked up a couple ideas. Good. Probably gonna cost me some money because uh, I need yeah. better tweezers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, if you if you use very many nut bolt washer castings, those pricey tweezers are worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Ron, uh, have you tried out your new uh, slicer? Have I tried what? Have you tried the slicer out? Oh, uh, no, actually, I can't say that I really have. I just received it a couple days ago. I uh, I've uh, mounted it on a piece of uh, plywood with rubber feet so it doesn't slide around. And I found a way to store it uh, because it's kind of uh, bulky. Um, and I've seen Al use it on his videos, but uh, 
I haven't really experienced it yet. Uh, I think it will be a great tool. Uh, I'm a little concerned about the fact that when you, since the knife is one, uh, only one side tapered, uh, you get one square side, but then the other side you have to cut off before you can get another piece off the same piece of strip wood, you know? I, uh, I first saw the slicer being demonstrated on uh, Russ Segner's uh, Off the Beaten Path clinic series for narrow gaugers. Yeah. And uh, I was really impressed with, uh, with the ability uh, to cut absolutely square ends on, uh, yeah. on strip wood up to about a quarter inch. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I think it's an impressive tool. Um, it, it's an impressive company too, frankly. Uh, I ordered mine right after that demonstration you mentioned, and uh, they did not have on their website yet the uh, uh, provision for ordering extra replaceable uh, mats and blades. Uh, so they just threw them in. They, they sent me replaceable match. Uh, uh, a set of replaceable blades and uh, a package of replaceable mats for free. And uh, I gather from the internet chatter that that was their uh, standard procedure for the first few days until they got their website cleaned up. <laughs> I see. So you, you lucked out. Yeah, the, the connection uh, with uh, Fast Tracks or Mount Albert Lumber is uh, um, Alistair, I forget his last name, who, who does the, the founder of Ultimation, was also the founder of uh, uh, Mount Albert Lumber. Right. Yeah, he found it and then he sold the business to uh, the Fast Tracks people. Yeah. Well, I, uh, on their sander, I, I uh, put off any action on that for a long time, even though I'm kind of a, tool junkie because I was skeptical about, <clears throat> I was so happy with my uh, power sander. I was really skeptical that a manual one could uh, do the same thing, but um, it's a great tool. And uh, for some very small parts I've worked with, or like I've been experimenting with individual bricks, his duplicator allows me to make individual bricks that are exactly the same size instead of approximately the same size. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? Anything else? Anybody want to share um, any other projects, tips, tip, tricks, or anything? Uh, if you, sure, if you... I'll, uh, uh, I'll, uh, to throw out a couple of things I've been working on. Uh, I've been uh, digging into uh, speed matching a couple of my favorite locomotives. And uh, these are new locomotives I bought recently from Scale Trains. They're a pair of uh, SD40 2s. And uh, they've got the new Loke Sound decoders in them. I found out that uh, to speed match them there, uh, you have to do something a little bit more involved than, uh, than what you would normally do with a uh, decoder. And uh, what that is, is that the low sound decoders to limit the speed on, on them, what you first have to do is to work with the three point speed table and limit the, 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 the high speed or the high voltage on it. And then you go back, well, well, once you get that to where you want it, you go back and uh, work with the speed table itself to uh, adjust it to different speeds that you, that you might want. So it was kind of a interesting learning experience. That's interesting. Thank you, Alex. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? Um, I'll show you something that uh, I just accomplished. Um, 
this goes back a ways. This is the original, uh, an original uh, Digitrax uh, DT300 throttle. And um, after a, a few years ago, it went dead. It was brain dead. It, you turn it on and, and the, the display would just blink between two settings and you couldn't do anything with it. And I found a, uh, I found a, uh, um, on a forum uh, that there's, there's two bad capacitors. Back in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, one or more of the small electrolytic capacitor manufacturers put out a rather huge batch of bad capacitors and Digitrax was one of their customers. Anyhow, I replaced the two capacitors and it now works. So if you have a brain dead DT300, it can be repaired. And if you want details, uh, email me and I'll, I'll, uh, I can help uh, possibly. <laughs> so anything else? Um, All right, well, tune in next month for uh, part three of uh, Ron's excellent series. And um, come to Mount Vernon in April on the 30th. I would be glad to see you there. Um, watch the grab iron for uh, further announcements. Um, I'm planning to uh, contact the vendors that we have signed up and um, uh, publish a list of uh, just a general list of some of the kinds of things that are going to be for sale. So uh, um, watch for that in a couple of weeks or so. What time is it going to start, it, Ted? Pardon? What time is it going to start? Uh, 10 a.m. Open the doors 10, 10 to 3. Okay. Uh, like I said, tables are still available. Only ten bucks, so you can't beat that. And the and the proceeds are all going to the. Uh, they're going to be donated to the uh, the Mount Vernon um, Meals on Wheels. Um, the the senior center is being very good to us since we've uh, paid for our evening rent for our evening meetings and ahead of time, and then didn't use them because of COVID. Uh, they're letting us. Uh, they're letting us use the uh, the facilities that Saturday for nothing. Well, so good. we thought they're being nice to us. So we'll do something nice for them. So, like I said, all the proceeds are uh, will be donated to the uh, Meals on Wheels. I have a question, Ted. Yeah. Is that a guitar case behind you on your left? Uh, no. Oh, looks it's, like it's a banjo. Oh, a banjo case. Oh. It's a five string banjo oh. that I haven't touched other than to move it around to get it out of my way for about 40 years. <laughs> but I'm, I'm kind of toying with the idea of maybe getting it out and try picking it some more. <laughs> You're going to wonder if you were practicing up. <laughs> I've been thinking about it. <laughs> Practice up and show us next time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> hey, Ted, uh, you, you could raise some additional money at the uh, Gab Fest by having a banjo concert. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> People be running out the door with their fingers in their ears. <laughs> Either that or pay you to stop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, oh, there's an idea. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to leave. So goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, Ivy. Give our best wishes and uh, prayers to your family. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> yeah, They're doing I'm good. Leaving. I'm leaving too. Good to see you all. All right. Have a good trip, John. Thanks a lot.
Well, if nobody else has anything to add, I'm going to uh, pull the plug on this uh, and stop the recording.